And turning back to America now and its favorite pastime, baseball, Major League Baseball, of course, banned African-American athletes at the end of the 19th century. They created their own league. Its success and popularity is the focus of a new documentary called The League, and here's a clip from the trailer. A few entrepreneurs see that a black club can be a successful business. Rube Foster, light years ahead of his time. F a manly. The first lady of black baseball. Negro League players made the game more up-tempo, bunt and run. Base stealing, these incredibly acrobatic catches. The major leaguers would say that the Negro Leagues didn't play the game the right way. Really, that was saying they didn't play the game the white way. And the critically acclaimed director, Sam Pollard, is joining Walter Isaacson to discuss how these players changed the game and transformed the country. Sam Pollard, welcome to the show. Congratulations on this great documentary, The League. Thank you, Walter. Great being here. Like me, you were a St. Louis Cardinals fan growing up. And I want to take you back to the year 1964, an amazing year when they come from behind to win the pennant. They've got Bill White and, you know, great first baseman, defensive player, wins the Golden Glove. Kurt Flood, who led the National League in hits and traded to them in the middle of the season is Lou Brock, who steals all these bases. One of the things about them is they're all African-Americans. When you're watching that pennant race, did you think about the fact they were African-Americans, and did you realize that just 20 years before, they wouldn't have been able to play? You know, I knew a little bit about Jackie Robinson integrating Major League Baseball in 47 with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and my dad was such a huge St. Louis Cardinals fan, I became a Cardinals fan. And it was just the idea of Lou Brock and Kurt Flood and Bill White and Bob Gibson on the field made it so special for me. So I didn't, I don't know if I was really thinking about this when these were African-American players, but, you know, they were Negro players to me back then, so it was important just to see them on the field. And I watched it on television. You know, we had that little black and white TV, and we saw all the games. So when I got the opportunity to work on this documentary about the Negro Leagues, and to really dig into not only understanding who Satchel Paige was and Josh Gibson was, who I knew about when I was 14 and 15, now I got to learn about, you know, Rube Foster and Effa Manley and Gus Greenlee, you know, and Composey and all the other phenomenal players and managers and owners who made the Negro Leagues, you know, so important in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. You know, the thing that struck me, I didn't know this, is that in the late 1800s, there were a lot of African-American players who played on mostly white teams. Let's look at a clip from your documentary that talks about that. African Americans have been playing baseball for as long as white people have been playing baseball. As the sport began to take hold in popularity post-Civil War, black people were there always. There were organized black teams and they barnstormed. They played against other black teams. They played against white teams. There were blacks who did play with whites on teams. The team was majority white and may have one or two black players on it. And that seemed to be something that was more acceptable to the white paying public if they only had one or two black players as opposed to a team that might have majority black players and one or two white players. But as we move forward through history, we see that segregation starts to tighten its hold. Tell me about these players in the late 1800s. Well, we always, you know, I was always under the assumption when I was in my teens that it was Jackie Robinson who was the first African-American to play integrated and in, was integrated into Major League Baseball. But in doing the research, we learned that there was a gentleman named Moses Fleetwood Walker in the late 18, 18, in the 1880s who was one of the African-Americans to play on these white teams. And there were other black players playing on those teams in the 1880s, 1890s, into the beginning of the 20th century. But then there was a gentleman's agreement that was really started by the Hall of Famer, Cap Anson, who basically didn't want to play with black players. And that sort of just really permeated all of the major league teams where they decided not to have any black players on those teams. You know, So that's what led to people like Rube Foster in 1920, with a bunch of other owners, Negro League owners, saying in Kansas City, Missouri, 
let's put together our own national league of black teams. And they created in 1920, the Negro national league, which really flourished for about 10 years until the untimely death of Ruth Foss around 1929, 1930. And then there was another sort of major upheaval in the thirties out of Pittsburgh, you know, which was a wonderful hub. You know, they had the, the factories and, and they had a lot of black people in the community and two men, basically started the second iteration of Negro baseball. And that was a gentleman named Crump Posey, who owned the Homestead Graves, and Gus Greenlee, who owned the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And those, those teams and those players and those teams were the things I really got to know about as a young man. And those are people like Satchel Page, the wonderful pitcher Satchel Page, the great home run hitter, Josh Gibson, you know, the player, Cool Papa Bell, Buck Leonard, Oscar Charleston. They were such phenomenal players. And they they were so good that they created, was sort of like what we just saw this past couple of days, the All-Star game. They called it the East-West Classic, where t- best players from, from the Eastern teams and the Western teams would come together and they would play baseball. And you know, and I know that back then when we were young men, baseball was the American pastime. Everybody loved baseball. Now, it's not the case so much anymore, but back then, that was everything everybody talked about. You know, baseball, baseball, baseball. Let's talk about some of the people in this documentary. Rube Foster fascinated me. Rube Foster is a phenomenal person. First of all, he was a great pitcher. Then he became a wonderful owner of the Chicago American Giants. Then he decided, I'm going to bring together not only my team, but other Negro League teams and owners to create the Negro National League. So he is the father of Negro League baseball. He had an untimely death in 1929, 1930, but his legacy has stood the test of time, and he is in the Hall of Fame. And then his mantle, that mantle was passed on to two other great owners, Cum Posey, who owned the Homestead Graves, and Gus Greenlee, who owned the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And those two men alone in the 30s really reignited Negro League Baseball. And they had wonderful players, Satchel Page, phenomenal pitcher, Josh Gibson, great hitter, Cool Papa Bell, who could run the bases with lightning speed, Oscar Charleston, Buck Leonard. You know, they had great players. And then you saw after World War II, there was another group of players who would be the first group that would go into major leagues. Monty Irving, who went to the New York Giants after Willie Mays. Jackie Robinson, who we all know, went to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Larry Doby from the Newark Eagles, who was the first African-American to play in the American League with the Cleveland Indians. You know, Willie Mays, Roy Campanella, Don Newcomb, the list goes on and on and on. So, you know, you can see that this history was extremely impactful. And the other thing I always want to say, that when I'm doing these documentaries about the African-American experience, I want people to clearly understand it was a part of, it's a part of American history. Yeah, let's talk about that part of American history, because starting with Plessy v. Ferguson, that's where the segregation happens in baseball. But you also see in the 1920s, even 1930s, during the Depression, when the Negro Leagues come up, it's connected with the newspapers, like the Chicago Defender. It's connected with black-owned businesses. So, and it even feels like a movement in your uh, documentary, like almost a civil rights movement. Tell me how it's connected to U.S. history. Well, here's the important thing to remember, that Black communities, which were basically segregated because we were been seen as second-class citizens, we had to figure out how to survive both, you know, culturally and economically. You know, we had to have our own businesses. We had to have our own doctors. We had to have our own lawyers. And the, and the Negro League teams and the Negro League owners was a part of that economic engine in those communities. You know, Black people could go to baseball games on the weekend. They could buy stuff from the concession stands. They could buy, you know, they could see the players play who got paid, you know. So the money that was that was generated by the Negro League owners and the teams went back into the Black community. And that's how these communities were able to survive, you know, and flourish, you know, because... We weren't being given anything. We were we were treated as second class citizens. So it was important that these teams came about because, like the funeral parlors, like the dentists, like the doctors, like the stores, there was another way for economically for the communities to flourish. You talk about Rube Foster being a great pitcher, but then helps form the Negro Leagues. Compare him as a pitcher to Satchel Paige, the most famous 
of uh, coming out of the Negro League. The thing about Satchel Page, historically and legend wise, he was considered the greatest Negro League pitcher ever. I mean, in the film, we tell a story of how he had the infield sit down, the outfield come in, and he struck out nine straight batters. You know, that shows you, you know, not, he struck out three pitches with nine, struck out three batters with nine pitches. You know, that shows you how great a player he was. It also was, shows what a showman he was. Tell me about that barnstorming time in the 30s with Dizzy and Daffy Dean playing Satchel Paige's team. What was that all about? Well, it was about making some extra money. It was off season. And these teams, you know, it wasn't like baseball players today who makes millions and millions of dollars. When the season was over and baseball players need to survive, they would go around the country and they would play local teams. They would play, black teams would play white teams to make some extra money, to generate some crowds. And this was an opportunity when they had the white teams playing the black teams for white people to see how talented the black Negro League players were, you know. And this led to the white press understanding maybe there should be some talks about integration. And be, and you had play, black paid newspapers like the Chicago Defenders, Chicago Defender, and the Pittsburgh Courier basically touting the same thing, the importance of maybe integrating Major League Baseball. Uh, we always think of Jackie Robinson you know, up there with Satchel Paige, first yeah. person to be brought in to be uh, integrating uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. First, let's look at a clip uh, involving Jackie Robinson. One of the very first uh, times that I went to see the game at Ebbets Field, first of all, <laughs> going on the subway, you'd have thought, all of Harlem was heading there. <laughs> Everybody I see, they're bringing along uh, baskets. They've got chicken. It's like a big picnic. All of Harlem now is going to Ebbets Field. And uh, so you know where they're going and you know why they're going. Jackie, everybody talking about Jackie. So tell me about the importance of Jackie Robinson and, and the owner, Branch Rickey, who brought him in. I always thought Branch Rickey was a hero but not quite so in your documentary. But we complicate who Brad Tricky is. I mean, listen, when I was 14 years old, Jackie Robinson was the cat's pajamas, man. We all said he was the greatest thing to happen to Major League Baseball when he integrated the Brooklyn Dodgers. And we all know the classic picture of the footage of Jackie Robinson signing a contract sitting next to Branch Rickey. And Branch Rickey is, in terms of mythology, is looked at as this wonderful human being who basically says to Jackie Robinson, we want you to integrate Major League Baseball, but you got to be able to deal with all the, you know, obscenities and racism and keep it all contained, you know, because it's going to be good for the sport. It's going to be good for your people. Now, what we didn't know about Mr. Ricky that we learned in this documentary was that he didn't want to compensate the Negro League owners for the players he signed, specifically Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, and Don Newcomb. And one of the owners, one of the Negro League owners, a woman named Effa Manley, who was a co-owner of the Newark, Newark Eagles, challenged, challenged this in, 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 in print. You know, how come Branch Rickey is not compensating Negro League owners for the players he's signing? And she was able to get Bill Beck, who was a wonderful showman for the Cleveland Indians, to compensate her for signing, for him signing Larry Doby became the first African-American to play in the American League, American League in 1948. So, you know, it's uh, it's always, for me, it's always interesting when you do these documentaries to be able to, you know, dig into a story and see the levels of complexity and see that it's a different way than you, the way you originally told the story. Jackie Robinson also becomes an early leader of the civil rights movement, an early face of the civil rights movement. Was that because of his experiences becoming the first black player in the major leagues? And how did that affect him? I think I think Jackie Robinson's, you know, becoming a voice in the civil rights movement goes back to even before he became a ball player. If you remember, he was court-martialed, you know, in the 40s when he was a soldier officer for not refusing to sit, refusing to sit in the back of the bus on the bus that he was on. You know, so he was always had a certain level of proactivism about who he was as a man of color, as a black man, you know, but he just became much more ferocious and much more void and had a bigger voice about it as his career evolved as a baseball player. 
Tell me what the integration of Major League Baseball did to the Negro Leagues. Well, with players like Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Ernie Banks and Jackie Robinson, can't all remember. of whom came from the Negro Leagues. They all came from the Negro Leagues, and you know, it 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 had off the fans. The fans wanted to see these players, so now they had an opportunity to go to. Major League, you know, baseball stadiums to see these players, which meant they didn't go to many Negro League games. And the Negro League teams started to suffer. They had lost some of their best players. They were losing their crowds, you know. So by 1960, it became diminished and it was lost forever. But it's sort of like, you know, a metaphor for what happens with integration. I mean, we all know the importance of Brown v. Board of Education, 1954. We all know the importance of the Montgomery bus boycott, you know, but, you know, integration is a very tricky thing in America. There's an upside and a downside to it. And even today, and you know this, Walter, like I do, there's communities all across America, you know, that supposedly integrated, but they're not, you know, because of, you know, economics, because of, you know, community locations, you know, so, this notion of integration in some ways was a downside for certain communities because those who were professionals, the doctors and the lawyers who had been forced to live within one type of community now had the opportunity to move out of those communities. And if you lost those kind of people out of your communities, then the communities would suffer from an economic perspective. That's fascinating. And that really struck me at the end of your documentary which talks about baseball, but it's also about society, America as a whole, and about civil rights in America, that double-edged sword of integration. Tell me about your probably complex emotions on that. Well, here I am as a young black man in the 60s, Walter, and what was I told as a young African-American in 64, 65? Forget about who you are, where you come from, become a part of the American melting pot and everything will be fine, right? Now, I bought that whole hog. I, I bought it completely. It was only until my 20s that I realized that being an American is very complicated. The history and the, and the genesis of this country, which is based on enslaved people, based on the decimation of Native people, is a long and complicated history. And as an African-American, who basically wants, as as, uh, as Sherman Hemsley would say, move on up, you know, in the Jeffersons, I had the same philosophy, but at what price? Everything is at the price, you know? So it's always complicated feelings. So it's like, you know, I live in Baltimore and I'm living in a part of the community that isn't completely the black community, even though it's close by. And it's always a challenge to understand where you want to be and how you want to be how you perceive yourself in this whole American, in this notion of being an American. And so baseball is always a metaphor for America. For me, it is. <laughs> Sam Pollock, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, us. Walter. My pleasure.